Hello everyone. This is louder than I thought, but uh, thank you for being here. Uh, it's great to be at the Monica Convention Center. It's the second uh, inaugural ATS show. Uh, we are, uh, uh, it's like a record attendance. We're very excited about it. What I wanted to talk to you guys about today was, uh, uh, as the title goes, creating a brand. But creating a brand for what's happening in the market space today. Um, we all look at like the, 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 the great brands over the last five years to 10 years, 25 years. What we can't do is emulate what they did to accomplish where they got. We have to look at how do we create a brand today for this generation using the tools available to us today. Investors no longer have the patience to wait like 15 years to get their return on investment. You know, designers no longer have the, the ability to, to just wait patiently for some retailer to come and fall in love with their product and get into market two or three years from now. Within 18 months, if your idea isn't at market, almost guaranteed someone else will have come up with that idea, executed it, and basically first to market wins. So a big part of our conversation, uh, as, as, as I meet a lot of the designers here that are visiting, a lot of the manufacturers that are visiting, a lot of the retailers, is how is the landscape shifting and what are the, the, what are the, the processes we need to apply to take advantage of that? So, Really quickly, I'll just go through some of uh, some of my background, but also I want to use the brands that we work with to look at how large brands have adapted to uh, remaining relevant. How iconic imagery that worked 25 years ago can be repeated and be relevant to a new generation. So I started my career at Calvin Klein, which is around 1995, six in, in New York. And at the time, the brand could do no wrong. You know, underwear was a $100 million business, jeans alone was 500 million, and it was already in every major city in the world. And, and you know, what Calvin was great for was always recognizing the face, the girl or the guy that connected with the 18 to 25 year old in such an organic way that it immediately made the consumer embrace the brand. So, so I think one of the things that we want to connect the dots on from what's worked to what continues to work, but using a different platform. So we're just not putting ads on billboards anymore, we're putting them on Instagram. The first time someone sees your brand is not the beautiful product that you create, not, not like the beautiful sketch that you made. It took you like a year to con conceptualize this, work with factories, come up with the concept. No one cares. You care, the press cares, the retailer cares, but we're in the business of selling fashion. And who are we selling it to? The girl or the guy that is either shopping online or going on Instagram and hoping that they're going to discover something unique and individual that will make them do it, make an impulse purchase. So the first time they're going to see your, you know, fifty thousand, a hundred thousand dollars worth of investment is for thirty seconds on Instagram or maybe Facebook. It'll come across, and if that image does not capture their attention. That's it, you missed that opportunity. Try again in three months with a new collection. So image becomes the single most important part of how we communicate with our consumer. And it is the first point of contact. This image right here, what worked 25 years ago, worked again about five years ago when, uh, I believe this was Francesco Costa, who was the creative director of Calvin Klein, who recognized Justin Bieber and brought, uh, I chose the, the, the Lara image, I can't remember the model's last name, but the same campaign had Kendall Jenner in, a, in it as well. Uh, same thing with Donna Karen. Where, uh, so I moved from Calvin, moved over to Donna Karen, and at, at the time, Donna Karen was a premium, was headed towards becoming a premium luxury brand. She wanted to separate herself from Calvin, but how did, you know, how do you stand out in the noise? There's like a million designers out there today, like at least 
I would say 100 times more than there were about 15 years ago. So two things have happened. Ease of entry means pretty much anyone can graduate, make a collection, take some pictures, and you're on Instagram, you make a website for like 500 bucks, and you're now a brand. The difference is everybody knows this, so everybody is doing it. So we go back to a level playing field on whose product is beautiful, how was it shot, and how, you know, how unique are you? What is the voice of your brand, and are you clearly communicating it? In this scenario, Donna started with like the 10, 10 essential dresses for a woman to wear to work, which ended up bringing a lot of like mid-30s, late, early 40s women who embraced the collection which led to the problem, oh my God, I'm so well embraced in this demographic, how do I get the younger girl, which brought about DKNY. So, a couple years ago, something that Tommy Hilfiger did, he embraced this collaboration, which was taking Cara Delevingne, who at the time had a, a larger Instagram following, uh, a larger social media engagement uh, than Bella, Gigi, and Kendall Jenner, and DKNY ended up doing a collaboration, and the first collaboration of its kind where a model's name came before the brand. To date, it has always been, you know, Tommy Wid or, you know, uh, Calvin Wid, and here it was for the first time, it was Kara Wid. Uh, and just to go back to that, the image that's not here is after, I think, a, a, like a significant number of years where Tommy Hilfiger was not growing at the level that they wanted to grow, the Gigi Hadid collaboration was a significant spike that the company saw uh, where what was supposed to be a capsule became a year-long agreement and now it's on its second year where the brand clearly puts Gigi's name before she is part of the creative direction team. She is part of she's the face of the campaign. She walks the runway, and they made a commitment to a personality. Um, Y3 is, is amazing because whereas when you're a designer, essentially what you're doing is you're creating the world the way you want that world to be, as opposed to when you're creating something that is active or something that's, that's sports-driven, you can be inspired by a real world, a real life. So it's, it, there's a sense of authenticity that you can bring into the brand. Y3 was able to do that. Uh, so just going back to, to Adidas, Adidas is a, a 13 billion euro company, but yet their tiny little division of sports style, which is a fashion forward arm, they felt that even for a company that big, with that much heritage, they still needed to reach the fashion crowd. They still needed to, they have all the authenticity in the world with the athletes and the sports that they sponsor. So they wanted authenticity and relevance in the high fashion world. So what do they do? They go get Yoji Yamamoto, and it became the first ever high-end fashion design collaboration with an athletic brand. So everything you see with Stella McCartney and Stella McCartney Golf with Adidas, or you see uh, that horrible, uh, 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 what's that brand called? Yeezy. Uh, and then uh, there, there's a, a, a few other just like, you know, nightmare collaborations out there that are purely for the sake of this random celebrity's uh, social following. In, in this scenario, you had someone who's high fashion aesthetic actually mirrored Adidas's uh, you know, DNA. And they were able to create Y3 to the point where 20 years later, the brand has its own DNA, it has its own vibe, it has its own life, and the athletes that wear Adidas are the same athletes that are wearing Y3. Earl Jeans is, um, again, you know, these are interesting case studies and I chose them mainly because they were the first in of their kind. So if, if you look at the history of denim, you've got, you know, Levi's owns like the first half of the century. And then after that, you got a bunch of like, you know, random designers, that, like, jeans that came about. 
with like everything from DoorDash to Gloria Vanderbilt and, and random brands like that, which drove the 80s, out of which came Calvin Klein. As a, as a clear leader. But it wasn't until the late 90s that you started to see a, a lesser focus on the designer aspect of denim, but a bigger focus on the washes, on the treatments, on the on, on the cuts, on the on the tearing. And that was the the, the 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 land of LA taking ownership that this is where we're gonna go. Now even though it was LA that was driving premium denim, it was diesel that owned it. So, you know, it's definitely worth looking at what did, you know, there was a, a massive war and a competition between Italy and LA on who was going to own premium denim. Multi-billion dollar market, and if you made a good pair of jeans, that meant you could make shirts, tops, jackets, outerwear, socks, shoes, whatever you wanted to extend your, your brand into. So, Earl is one of the first premium brands out of LA, which was smart enough to find Giselle, who ended up being the face of the brand. And when it was resold to Jordache and relaunched, one of the biggest challenges was how do we get the image archives? Not only the patterns for the jeans to be able to reproduce the cuts and, and, and the actual fitting, but also the imagery which came with the trademark. Um, so, and this is the last one I'll go over. Jumpy Savali was a, you know, and this is something that if you're an aspiring designer, think of the non-traditional ways on how you can launch your company. Uh, it is almost impossible for our industry, especially creative entrepreneurs, to attract any kind of serious institutional money to help you launch your brand. At the same time, VCs are very gun-shy. They don't understand the industry. Investors want fast returns. They do not understand the amount of time it goes into product development, sampling, perfecting, image building, marketing, PR, trade shows, runway shows, influencer. That all happens before you get like $1 in revenue. So how do we intelligently plan to have a year's worth of runway of money to help us get to the point where we can actually start generating revenue. John Batista Valli was, you know, creative director of Emmanuel Ongaro, leaves Ongaro. How many here know John Batista Valli? All right, awesome, at least a few people, cool. So Valli was creative director of Ongaro, not a big deal, had a job like everybody else, decides to leave Ongaro, looking for a job. Uh, wanted to launch his own brand, did not have the money. We wanted to work with him, he couldn't afford us. So what do we do? We basically find him a factory in Italy. The, the factory in Italy needed a designer. We give him John Batista. He designs for iceberg jeans. They pay for his sampling. They pay us to sell both brands in New York. So what this does is it gave John Batista Bali the ability to create samples at no cost, get a salary to fund his company, and get a sales team that works on commission, and now he gets to launch in the US, still maintaining 100% equity in his company. So this is, you know, time and time again, it's not luck. It's really understanding the food chain. It's understanding that if you're a designer just coming out of school, you know, your best friend better own a factory or he must have money, right? Or she's like a really famous model with a ton of followers. Something of that sort. But you're gonna need three or four people that makes up the family that's gonna help you move forward. Individually, it's, it's, it's impossible. Save your money, don't go into fashion. But you know, otherwise, go build a team from day one. And that team can just be a bunch of friends, a bunch of freelancers. If you're coming out of the system, if you're coming out of the school system, find them. If you're coming out of a community, find them. But don't start and then be like, where am I gonna make this stuff? And then be like, oh, where am I gonna find the show? Oh, is there a studio someplace? Who's gonna shoot this? Who's gonna be my model? Every single thing, as you, if you look for it when you need it, it's already too late because you'll be paying two or three times the price that you should have paid to begin with. So I, I, so I love Jamba's story because he went from like zero to like 10 million. We got Katie Holmes aware when it was, it was in some show. And he actually listened to understanding what the American market wanted. And in my opinion, he's one of the greatest 
custom designers today. Um, Carlos Mealy, Hudson Jeans. Um, let's skip these. Oh, here. This is, so this was a factory. This is relevant actually for a lot of the vendors here. So if you're a manufacturer and you are a rock star, you're doing embroidery for like Oscar de la Renta, you're making goods for, for Under Armour, at some point you've got to ask yourself, why am I making this thing for $7 and he's selling it for $95? And I'm the one that found the fabric, I'm the one that created the pattern, I'm the one that sewed it. What, what am I doing wrong? You're not doing anything wrong, you just haven't figured out the front end of the food chain. So if you have one capability, which is manufacturing, then you better find the other capability, which is design, marketing, sales. This was a company, this is a, a, a great little story. So, so the stylist for Rihanna liked a jacket from Palma. Uh, uh, and uh, wanted to wear it for her concert, and Balma was like, you know, uh, she was, so she loved the jacket, the embroidery was beautiful. Her request was, can we put this embroidery on the arms as well? And the designer was like, who the hell are you? Of course not, I'm not gonna do that. I'm not gonna touch my, my, my garment. You either wear it or not. So between me and the stylist, we're like, well, this is horrible. How do we make this happen? So I happen to know the factory in India that actually did the embroidery. We bought two of the jackets. We send it to the, 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 the factory. The factory puts the embroideries on the arm. And if you Google about, I think it was in like 2012, uh, Rihanna wore that jacket throughout her tour. And it had the embroidery on the arms. Of course, we were both fired, but you know, the, the, the jacket made it all over the concert. It was the like, most exciting thing ever. So this factory in India tells me like, Sal, like, can you, like, this was awesome. Like, how can you get us? Can you help us become Bama? Like, of course not. But I'm afraid we can do something near that. And that's where we started creating this collection, utilizing their core competency. I didn't tell this embroidery factory that we're going to create Bama. I don't have the the money to pay. You know, uh, like like the creative director, we don't have that heritage, but we could use their skill set to create an advanced contemporary brand that was, you know, that was making leather, leather leggings that were under the J brand and um, under the price points of, of, of Row and a lot of those advanced, a lot of designer brands, but with a lot more plus to it. So better fabrication and a little detail to it allowed us to position ourselves in the department stores as a new brand, but how did we do that? You can't just think I'm gonna make something and someone's gonna buy it. There's nothing out there that has not already been made or is being made by someone that is bigger, better, and richer than you are. So whatever it is that you're gonna make, make sure there's an opinion to it, there's an aesthetic to it, and there's a uniqueness to it. And because what you're trying to do is you're trying to take market share away from someone. So look at who's making whatever it is that you wanna make, how do you differentiate yourself, and then lower your price by 20%, and add 20% more to it. The reason being, you shouldn't be like, oh, my dress is more beautiful than, than, than uh, Alice and Olivia's dress. Yes, but Alice and Olivia have been around for 15 years and spent well over $100 million in marketing and building her brand and has retail store around the world. So that gives her the right to be 25% higher in price point and 25% worse in quality. So this is like a very generic formula. So for you to enter the landscape, the buyer's got to see clear price value on your product. How much better is it and how much cheaper is it to make up for the fact that no one walking into the store has any idea of the price point, of, of the brand's name. Anyways, um, Sachin and Bobby was, was the brand that, that, that was created. It was, uh, uh, ended up getting it into Saks, Neiman's, uh, and uh, Nordstrom's, Gordon Taylor, a bunch of stores does around 12 or 15 million dollars today, but essentially it was an embroidery factory that started doing evening dresses, which then went into um, advanced contemporary. Vivian Tam, amazing brand. I'll skip that. All right, so how much time do I have? All right, I got 10 minutes. 
before discussing brand creation, let's define a brand, all right? So, so there's nothing more frustrating for those of us that are in the business of fashion when someone says, I'm a brand. It is like the biggest insult to actual brands. You know, the brands took, you know, 50 years, 100 years, 200 years to build their reputation before they went out and said, oh, let me make a fragrance or let me make shoes. So we don't have to wait 200 years, but what we can do is understand what it what's required for you to create a brand. You can create a brand in a matter of a few months, but to become one in the eyes of the consumer, you truly have to fulfill certain promises. Right, so, so how did you know, a young woman making clothes in an atelier end up you know, having like you know, diamond blinged out chains on in rap videos you know, 50 years later? And how is that tweed jacket still so relevant? You know, because they were able to create a halo of aspiration. If you think about logos where you can just look at an image and it instantly creates a, an experience or creates an emotion within you. So it's, it's something, you know, what is a brand? It, it, it lights a fire. It makes your heart beat faster. It engages you. The, the idea of, of, you know, if, I, if I'm wearing a white t-shirt with a polo pony, all of a sudden I feel rich, but if I have one with a swoosh on, I wanna go for a run. How can a single image completely change our perspective of the same white t-shirt? Fulfills a promise. So, 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 you know, regardless of how many other companies have come out with better products, uh, you know, more user-friendly uh, uh, apps, uh, lower price points, there's a insane sense of loyalty because you believe that this brand fulfills your promise. Th I, I put this in there because it's, it's interesting because one of the most important thing a brand does is it manages to cut across generations. And a, a few years ago, the study was done that this brand essentially is better known than any other in the world, and they only come out with one product every three years. So it is one of the highest valued brands uh, compared to the product that it puts out in the world today. And there's at least three generations that have the same affinity to it as the generation before them. So that's that's something that, that that's quite unique. Uh, so, so the, 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 the idea of you know, taking you know, a stroll down memory lane is to understand that, that it's not about ignoring the past, it's about selectively forgetting what is no longer relevant and filling it in with what is relevant. So what's, what's next? You know, th this, this is a game, you know, all of us know about Bloomberg, and, and with all of its, its, its firepower, with all of its content, it's reaching 300 million viewers. And we have a 21-year-old who's making 35 million a year, she doesn't make a product. And, and it's because of her personal engagement with her audience. So we no longer need to buy billboards and place ads in magazines. Content is king, but the kind of content that we are creating must engage, it can't lay flat. So for the first, you know, in the, in the early days of, of Instagram, there were two brands, and still today, I would say they're still in the top two. There are two brands that stood out as pioneers. It was Tory Burch and Burberry. Whereas everyone else in, like, in, in, in the luxury world in Italy and France were like, we're not going to open a Facebook page. We, we're, we're above that. These two guys went out there and started putting their ad campaigns up there, started putting engagement up there, and Burberry owned Facebook when Facebook was relevant uh, for the first year or so. The difference was Burberry was too worried about people writing on their Facebook page. And when Tory Burch lo uh, launched, 
they allowed people to comment. So they weren't fearful of the negativity. They just figured, okay, even negative commentary is better than no commentary, and they got twice the engagement. And that's where, from that point onward, every brand took that lead, and it was all about engagement. So, so you know, at the end of the day, we're in the business of selling clothes. So it's creativity, but commerce. So we can't get caught up in design is everything, manufacturing is everything, product development is everything, because the mistake we all make is we put all of our energy, all of our money into product development. Of course, we, that's because we, we love product development. We love like beautiful clothes, and then okay, all right, we have a little bit of money left, we'll take some pictures. But at the end of the day, you have to understand that is no more than 30% of the business. And that's being generous, because I'm sure they're creatives. But the reality is, after that, people aren't just gonna find you. You have to have a clear communication marketing strategy. You have to understand what is the importance of the difference between a runway show and a presentation. What is the relevance of one specific to the kind of positioning your brand has? If you're a luxury, maybe a runway show is important. I do not believe it is important anymore today, as I say this right before our runway show. <laughs> runway shows are the single most important thing out there. <laughs> Can't wait to see the designers coming out. <laughs> The, the idea of runway shows is runway shows are a brilliant vehicle to engage your existing consumers. They are not necessarily the smartest way for a startup to spend their budget to get their first round of customers. When you have your customers, then to support them, you do runway shows. But till then, find a gallery, find a space, do a presentation, engage the press, engage the influencers, get some orders, get it into a retail store. So then, when you get some press, it can actually say, hashtag Neiman Marcus Val Harbor. So if somebody actually finds you, they know where to go buy you. Until then, press is like iCloud. You'll never find anything. Um, if you're gonna launch a brand, we discussed this, selectively forget the past, but really think about, create the future. But most important, and, and most important, make it hot. We are not in the business of necessities. We are not selling anything to anyone that they actually need. It's like no one needs their 14th handbag, their, their, their 25th jean, their, their you know, 35th swimsuit. It's, we, we are in the business of making people feel good about themselves at a time when they're just like surfing or walking or, 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 or just leisure. So what's, nobody needs another black dress, not from this audience. Because the buyer is going to find that black dress from Alaya or Dior or Vince or Scotch and Soda or all the multi-billion dollar brands out there that the whole world knows about. So if you're going to make one, make sure it has authenticity, make sure it has some unique aspect, make sure it has art, make sure it's using an innovative fabric, make sure that, that, that there's a message behind it. Sustainability is no longer a unique selling point. Sustainability is the future. So just build it into your business plan. You can't say, I'm gonna build a sustainable brand. Everyone out there is building a sustainable brand. So just make sure that you're building a brand with sustainability and ethical sourcing, all of that factored into your cost structure. So this is, we'll, we'll end with this, and if I have, a, I think, a minute or so, uh, we'll, we'll take some questions. So how do we do it? How do we build a brand today? And you guys can, can take a look at this. You know, it, it's, it's essentially, it, it's not rocket science, but every single one of these things that's written is a very important exercise that you can do. You have to understand that what is the process, knowing the competitive landscape, identifying the market opportunity, figuring out what niche, what, what market share you're gonna take, building the right product with a unique brand sensibility, finding the target demo for the right retail partner, at the sharpest margin with brilliant marketing, with a focused sales strategy within a budget. And only you know these answers. You know your budget, no one else does. 
And yes, a brand can be launched with 20,000 and it can be launched with 200,000. It's just a matter of knowing that when you spent that 20,000, what is your action plan? You know, is it your friend's apartment where you're gonna throw a party, invite a bunch of friends and tell them, buy my samples, pay me now, and I'll ship it to you in three months. And that's your cash flow for your first round of production. But if you don't even have that plan, don't make the samples. You know, if, if you don't know how to create a website, find someone to make it for you for a few hundred dollars, not a few thousand dollars. So the idea is knowing this process and at whatever budget you're gonna do it at, do it at the highest standard. Um, I think we will have to leave it at that. Uh, and I'll leave it. We'll leave it here. Um, so, <laughs> the clock says zero, zero, zero. All right, any uh, quick questions? And then what I'd love to do is, uh, uh, we'll go right into the show. Harvey. We, we, we got some time for a few questions. We're just right. finishing things up back there. So does anybody have any questions for Sal? I'll bring the microphone over, over there. It's always on the other side of the stage. You know what, I'm just gonna hop over. I know it's sure. not etiquette, but there we go. Hi, Sal. Hi. How do you uh, balance the line of pricing where you're going, you're an unknown brand, so you're gonna go under the price like you said, um, but then you might have the challenge of battling all the fast fashion brands, and then also balance then, maybe I raise the price point so that the customer knows that there's quality and a higher end brand image. So, so it's it's quite depressing to go online and look at H&M or look at, look at, look at uh, uh, even, even Zara, because it's like, why even bother? Uh, the, so we can't, as a startup, or at, even as a small or medium enterprise, if you're under 20, 30 million dollars, it's almost impossible to compete uh, with fast fashion. So, unless, you find some nice little person here in one of the booths and create a joint venture with them. And now all of a sudden, you can be competitive with h and So other than that, I think it comes back to price value for the garment. So you have to figure out, forget mass market, because that's quantities, volume, and, 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 and partnerships with factories. Where you can position yourself is in the contemporary landscape, in the advanced contemporary landscape, and be competitive from a design aesthetic uh, standpoint. You can't uh, start going crazy with fabrications because then that will elevate you a whole other level, and now you're competing with designer. So whatever you do, you know, if you look at a, a brand like Vince or Rogue, they're very simple, clean brands, but their fabric choices are just perfect. But uh, but they're expensive because of those fabric choices. So if you start doing that, then you end up being in that same lead. Uh, my, you know, the thought process is you just have to eat your market. You just can't use the formula that everyone else is using before you have the volume that everyone else has. So you, you make it for, it costs you 20 bucks, your wholesale is 40, your retailer wants to sell it for uh, 120. So the retailer isn't gonna change, and the cost isn't going to change. So the only thing that can change is you want the retailer to actually sell it for $99 so you can beat your competitors, which means you're going to have to shrink your margin and come down to $30 so he can sell it for $99. Now when you do that, you better have a pop-up direct-to-consumer or an online strategy where you can make the full margin from $30 to $99. So when you take a shared margin of your wholesale margin and your direct-to-consumer margin, it'll balance itself out. Anybody else? We do have time for one more question. If anybody has a question for Sal. Oh, right over here. Okay, there you go. Okay. No question. Oh, sorry, I saw your hand go up. Okay. Right over here. Anybody else? So while you're on the topic of sales um, and, and this whole margin thing, do you recommend um, sources like Brand Boom or any similar, um, uh, I guess, apps that help you with the wholesaling side of things? Um, so, 
there are a few trade shows out there that have created online platforms for brands that show in their shows, but after that, they can live on that online platform so the buyer still, can still go find them. So those apps have not proven to be successful as of date. Initially, when they came out, they came out about like five or six years ago, so they should have like blown up by now. They did not. Uh, they're a facilitator. They are not the solution. I still believe that uh, either uh, take a space in a collaborative environment, which is a multi-brand showroom space, or a trade show to initially see as many possible uh, buyers. Uh, but after that, even that is purely a facilitator. Uh, sourcing shows have been very effective, but brand to retail shows have really dropped down in engagement as of late. Uh, that doesn't mean they're not working, it just means that there's a second step required. Do the show, but don't expect orders to be written there. You'll meet people, you'll physically have to call them up, you'll physically have to take your samples to them the week after. This is the challenge that a lot of international designers don't understand. They'll come to a show, but nobody came. Of course nobody came. Were you marketing that you were gonna be at the show for 60 to 90 days beforehand? Did you buy a list or did you recruit a freelance salesperson to send those emails out? Did you make personal phone calls to get those buyers in? And it's your fault, it's not the trade show's fault. The trade show's renting booths. So if you look at Coterie, if you look at a lot of these uh, brand to retailer shows, I think they have gotten out of the business of marketing. They're expecting the brand to do their own marketing. So my issue with that is, even though it's not the best solution, it's one of the only vehicles out there, but just add factor in that you're personally gonna have to stay a week later or go back a month later when the buyers get back from the European market to physically go and show them the sample. And don't worry about the major department stores. If you can get the online platforms and if you can get the local boutiques, if you get like 10 stores in Florida, that's a win. You get 10, 10 stores in like North Carolina, 10 in Texas, that's a win. When you get that, by that time, the department stores will catch up or they'll have gone bankrupt and they'll like restart again and then they'll be like a whole new retail game and we'll, we'll actually be able to do business. All right, I think we will wrap and uh, the show should be starting um, right after this. If you're here, I uh, hope you guys enjoy it. Thank you very much.